Good morning, everyone. Before you sit down, you already sat down, greet at least, not a thousand, greet at least three or four people beside you, okay? Good morning again. It's been a while they haven't been here, probably five months, six months, or probably even a year. Probably there's some of you here who are new and probably uh, doesn't know me yet. Well, my name is Dan Ramirez. Okay, I'm, I'm a member of this church. been here for a while. And uh, Pastor Joe is our team captain way back during our Las Al days, team captain of our football. So that's our... That's our relationship, so I'm so glad and thankful that I could, can be with you this morning and uh, also happy with this opportunity that I could be with you and share God's word with you this morning. Uh, the title of our message is Our Eternal Salvation. Pretty good message, and you know, I just gave this message to our small group probably about a month ago, and it has created some questions and interests to everyone because it deals with a question can a believer lose his salvation very important question right oh let me just rephrase that can a true believer lose his salvation it was a question then even way back at the time of the apostle paul and it is a question now uh, and since it is a matter of great importance you will see in the text that we're going to look at in Romans chapter 8 verses 28 to 39 you will see that the Apostle Paul dealt or addressed this particular issue quite extensively and I just would like you to pay very close attention to those verses that I'm going to give you and those texts that I've given you because here the Apostle Paul not only extensively gave his, uh, not opinion, but gave his conviction about this, this particular subject, but he did it very strongly, I would say, and conclusively. And we as a church, I believe, I believe that you, we should be clear about this particular issue. Now, uh, as I mentioned, the issue dates back to the time when but Apostle Paul and since it is a matter of great importance, it's important for us also that as a church, we should also deal this matter uh, conclusively because this is pertaining to our salvation. Because as, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have put our trust in him, there is no middle ground, okay? There is no middle ground. We had just have to be very, very sure that this particular salvation that's given to us is it. It is it. So I just would like to bring you to the book of Romans in Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to 29. Actually, when they ask me for a, uh, what is this, a topic or an outline, I said I don't have any outline, just the title and those verses that we're just going to look at this morning. And I just want you to follow very closely the flow on those verses from verse 28 down to verse 29 as we consider this particular question. And let me rephrase that again. Can a believer, can a true believer lose his salvation? Now first, uh, let us consider in some details the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And the reason for that is because the Holy Spirit plays a very important role in as far as our salvation is, is, is concerned, and more specifically, in securing, in securing that salvation, that precious salvation that God has given to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason I brought up this uh, subject about the Holy Spirit is that there's just a feeling in my heart, not probably in your heart, because probably you have a very a good uh, uh, what is this, uh, a good knowledge, understanding about the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. But somehow, I just feel within me that quite a number of us doesn't have that uh, complete or uh, biblical knowledge, I would say, about the Holy Spirit. So that feeling in my heart is that 
the Holy Spirit is a member of the Trinity that's being left out. In our worship, in our teaching, and in his, in our, even in our Christian living. Much has been said about uh, the Father and the Son, but li little is said about the Holy Spirit. So, so I, I just would like to take this opportunity to uh, refresh our minds about the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a member of the Trinity that all of us who have that real, genuine, and true relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, he's a member of the Trinity that we are most indebted to our Christian experience. He is the one who makes our salvation a reality in us. The, the feeling, the joy, the peace, and the works of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit that is being manifested in each of our lives, in each of our lives, it is being attributed to the work of the Holy Spirit. So I would say that if we are to worship God fully, fully, we have to worship the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit with a full knowledge of each of them as being revealed in the Bible. The Father planned our redemption in the eternity past, before the foundation of the world. He already planned you and me who's going to be saved. He already planned the redemption. The Son provided the means of redemption. And the Holy Spirit produced the work of redemption. The Holy Spirit is the agent that brought about the actuality of our salvation, the joy that you're feeling, the exuberance, and the peace that transcends all understanding is all attributed to the work of the Holy Spirit. Whatever joy, joy, the unexplainable joy that you and I are experiencing, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. He is the one that brought about the actuality of our salvation. He is the one who activates it. In other words, he is the one who puts our salvation into motion, into reality, into an experience to each and every one of us. However, the Bible, the Bible warns us in a number of things that we are not to grieve the Holy Spirit. And understandably, we all know that. One way we can grieve the Holy Spirit is when we sin. When we sin, we grieve the Holy Spirit. Remember times? If you're truly born again, this is one big indication that you are really and truly born again when you feel the sadness of a result of sin that you have committed. When there is uh, within you that kind of uh, feeling, that kind of sadness that you have offended someone, that you have offended someone in a in a way that has brought about this sadness in your life, then you can say that you truly are born again. And it's the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And that's the way we can grieve the Holy Spirit. We are also warned that we are not supposed to quench the Holy Spirit. How do we quench the Holy Spirit? We quench the Holy Spirit when we are doing something something and success that has been given to us when we attribute it to ourselves and not to the Holy Spirit. That's how we can quench the Holy Spirit. And thirdly, that's another, and secondly, uh, thirdly, yes, that's another way of insulting the Holy Spirit because he's the one who empowers us. And then lastly, we are being warned not to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Let me just explain this a little bit because this is something that intrigued me. I was, as, as I was reading the Word of God, and I encountered that passage where Jesus Christ was saying, you can heap insults upon me, you can say anything about me, but the sin of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit cannot be forgiven. So that just caught my attention. I said, I just would, would like to look closely into this particular subject. And I was blessed to be able to sit with one of the... Uh, well-known professor of Dallas Theological Seminary. He was in Manila. I think he already passed away. His name is Dwight Pentecost. He is the professor emeritus of Dallas Theological Seminary. And this is his ex explanation about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, he said, is no longer possible now. Because it has got to be with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And in his absence right now, because he has resurrected into heaven, that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit cannot be committed anymore. So in other words, uh, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit right now, you say something, that's his view. You say something, and without Jesus Christ, this particular sin is no longer possible. But then there's another, another view. I think I'm, I'm presenting this to you so, so you just can, could balance your knowledge about the, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. The modern-day blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is like this. Uh, it's uh, the opportunity that you were able to have the gospel shared to you. It has been given to you very clearly. You understood every aspect of the, 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 the gospel, your sinfulness, and the, the atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and about His grace, and you understand all these things. And it has been confirmed intellectually, and you believe with your heart that this is really the true, uh, the, the true message of the gospel. But then you deliberately continue to reject it. Then that's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's something that God cannot do anything about your own life. Unlike in the past, unlike in the past, in the absence of the Lord Jesus Christ, this particular sin cannot be committed. You know why the religious leaders were guilty of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? It was because in their very, for their very eyes, they have seen the miraculous power of the Lord Jesus Christ. They, say they have seen the lame walk, the blind see, the lepers cleanse. You know, I could just imagine, you know, just be right before. Have you seen a leper? I've seen one drop blah, my leper colony, the Siluilu. I've seen one. They're just far. They won't, won't even get close to you. I've seen one, and they, they would not, I've seen part of his skin, but you know what? They, they, he's beginning to lo lose his fingers because they don't have sensation. It, it's just full of white spots, and you know what? It's just so ugly. Before the very eyes of these religious leaders, this was cleansed before their very eyes with the miraculous power of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then they would attribute it to the devil. That, for me, is a true blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Then there is this uh, attributes to the Holy Spirit also that we are going to look. He's the one who regenerates us. He regenerates us. In John chapter 3, this, this is what uh, our Lord Jesus Christ explained to Nicodemus, that unless you be born again of the Spirit and of water, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. He's the one who regenerates us. He's the one who convicts us, I'm saying. I explained it to you earlier. The only way you could verify that you truly are born again if that spirit within you, within you, is trying to tell you in a still small voice telling you that you have sinned, you need to go back. Go back. He also convicts us, convicts of, of righteousness and, just, and judgment. There's that Holy Spirit who continually speaks to us. You know, he's, and he's continually saying to us, the God that you have committed your life is a holy God, therefore you are to be holy before this God. He's also the God who convicts us of judgment. You know, judgment, never in my life that judgment had been so clear, that the reality of hell had never been so clear to me as when that spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ indwelt my life. And this is always the very thing, every time I share the gospel, this is the very thing that I tell them, you know what? I don't want you to go into that place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, a, fire, a place burning with brimstone, a bottomless pit, total darkness, and all those stuff, and you're going to be there for all eternity. You know, that scares me, really. That's the Holy Spirit's working in my own life and in your life. Trying to tell us, not trying to scare us, but very lovingly telling us there's just going to be, there's just going to be a dire consequences, consequences if you are going in that direction. So he's the one who convicts us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And he's also the one who participates in our sanctification and justification. He's the one who leads us into a life that is holy and pleasing to our God. And he is also the one who tells us, tells us that you have been justified. You know, justification is a position. 
It's a position. This is what the Bible tells us, that you had been moved from darkness into the kingdom of light. That's justification. It's a change of position from one who is condemned to one who is justified as one who's worthy of heaven. Another one is he confirms our adoption as sons. Adoption as sons, he takes up his residence in us, Romans chapter 8, and he witnesses to our spirits. Now, this is a beautiful thing that the Holy Spirit is doing to each of our lives. It's a spirit-to-spirit communication wherein his spirit, who is resident in us, communicate with our spirit that we truly are a child of God. And he does that day in and day out, every moment of our lives. What a wonderful, what a wonderful ministry of the Holy Spirit. He baptizes us into the body of Christ, meaning he incorporates us into the universal, invisible body of Christ. Because if you are a person who has surrendered and accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and personal Savior, you belong to the universal, invisible body of Christ. That's only God can see it. You might be a Japanese, a Chinese, Filipino, American, European. You have the spirit of Jesus Christ and he puts you in one body which is called the invisible body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Gives us spiritual gifts. Assists us in our prayers. The times and moments when we have difficulty praying because we are probably overwhelmed with so much pressure and problem that the world in this world that we are living, then he assists us. He helps us that we would be able to lift up a prayer before a God that really comes from the heart and then strengthen us in the inner man. What a, what a work. Guides us in everything that we do. You know what? Without just our clear or sometimes unconsciously, we just go to this direction only to find out only to find out that it's the right direction you're going. Not sure where you're going, but then you know what? It's the fruit, the work of the Holy Spirit doing in our lives. Doing in our lives. And then he produces those fruit in us. The gift that you, the gift that you contribute to the church where, where, where it's being used by God in trying that the church grow, in edifying the church, in edifying the church. That's one of the work of the Holy Spirit delivers us from sin, delivers us from sin. Help us to be obedient, illuminate the word of God. Before reading the Bible, before we came to know the Lord reading the Bible, I have a friend who tells me, you know, Dan, before, before I became a Christian reading the Bible, I can't understand the word of it. But now, I just don't know. The whole Bible is just opening up, and every time I read it, you know, the pages of the Bible just reveals to me the presence of our God, and there's that sweet communion that develops as I commune with His Word. And last point here, although there are a number of attributes of the Holy Spirit, the last one is the Holy Spirit is the internal truth teacher. He will lead us into all truth. He will lead us into all truth false doctrines and teachings and philosophies that we have learned and accumulated in the past is being slowly checked and corrected by the Holy Spirit because one of his ministry is to lead us into all truth that my, our lives, each of our lives, might conform to what God wants us to be. And then, and this is, this is the climax. On top of all those attributes and work and ministry of the Holy Spirit is the capstone. The capstone. And the capstone is that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit secures our eternal salvation. That's beautiful. You know, if you're going to look at all those attributes that I had mentioned, just mentioned to you, they all point to his work, saying to it, that from the moment you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, as you go through this life, he will see to it that you will reach your final destination. That is the capstone of the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, as we go through life, will help us in everything, will protect us against sin, will, will direct us and guide us 
and guide us until we reach that promised glorification that God is giving to us. That is the theme of Romans chapter 8, that salvation is forever. Salvation is forever because it is protected by the power of God until our final glorification and into what? As the Apostle, Apostle Peter puts it in, 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 in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, and he said, into an inheritance that will never fade or spoil, kept in heaven for all of us and ready to be revealed in the last day. So that is Paul's argument. His argument is, if you are saved, it is forever. It is forever. And I am thankful that as I stand here before you, as I stand here before you, this is also the stand and the belief of our church. I talked to Pastor Joe. Pastor Joe, I'm going to be preaching somewhat a, I don't know if it is controversial or what, but uh, I'm going to be preaching a topic that is once saved, always saved. As Pastor Joe said, go ahead. I think our congregation needs that. And Pastor Norman, Pastor Norman also of Ictus Ililo confirmed that. He said, you can quote me on that, Brother Dan. So I'm, as I'm standing here before you, there is just that confidence in me as I am bringing this topic before you. Before you. This is that, that confidence in my heart about this particular topic that I am bringing to you. But, you know, I'm leaving this open in the end. At the end, you can make your decision after I am through with this message. You be the judge. You be the judge after this message. So here, let me go back. If you are saved, this is Paul's argument. If you are saved, it is forever. Guaranteed by the Holy Spirit. In Romans chapter 8, verse 30, and it's going to be flashed there in a while. Romans chapter 8, verse 30. Let me just quote this to you. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. You know, I was talking to Brother Ralph there at the back, and he said, you know what, that verse, Romans 8, uh, chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, verse 30, is an unbreakable chain. And I believe that. Because somewhere in the middle, nobody is going to be lost. If God predestined you to be saved, way back in the eternity past, when he has planned for your life, when you get to be born in this world, he's going to call you. And some, somehow, sometimes, there's some resistance on our part that we resist it. But ultimately, because he called you, he already predetermined you, you're going to respond to the message of salvation. And after he called you, he will justify you, put into a just, righteous status. And after he has justified you, there is that promise of justification and nobody is lost somewhere along the way. And then in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, a beautiful verse that all of us know about it. And we know that all things, God works for the good, for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to that purpose. Romans 8, 28. In other words, in as far as our eternal salvation is concerned, you know what God is going to do? God will cause all things to work for our eternal goods. Know that. No one is going to be lost along life's way. That once you're saved, you will always be saved. And you know what? That's not of your own work. It's the work of the Holy Spirit, and it's a promise from God that you're not going to, to lose it. Now, you know what? The Apostle Paul as he's making this particular statement about our eternal salvation, he understands that there's just going to be some objections. There are going to be people who's going to object it. And that's precisely the reason why he wrote Romans chapter 8, and specifically the, those verses from 28 to 39, because in his time, there are people who questions about the eternality of our salvation. So here, the Apostle Paul anticipates those questions and objections, and he wrote it here in verse 33, Romans 8, verse 33. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Who then is the one who condemns? Verse 34. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Verse 35. 
And then verse 35b, shall trouble, hardship, persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? These are the argument that the Apostle Paul is bringing about because of his assertion about the eternality of our salvation. In other words, the Apostle Paul here is bringing two possibilities. One is that some person, some person, with the words he asks, who? In verse 33, 33, 34, and 35, with those words, who? In other words, the Apostle Paul was saying that some person can cause you to lose your salvation. And then secondly, that some circumstances can cause you to lose your salvation or forfeit it. Shall trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, or danger, or sword. There's just two possibilities, actually. And these are the two possibilities that the Apostle Paul is bringing up to us. In other words, he was asking, can some person, can some powerful person, can cause you to lose your salvation in spite of the work of the Holy Spirit and in spite of the provision of our Lord Jesus Christ? And secondly, can some events and circumstances that could happen in our lives can be so overwhelming and so powerful that we forfeit, that we forfeit our salvation? And then notice what he said in verse 31. And in verse 31, he said, what then shall we say in response to these things? What is the Apostle Paul asking? What things is he referring to? Of course, things concerning our eternal salvation. That is the topic, right? In other words, the Apostle Paul was asking here, what conclusion can we draw from this? Can, we, can it be lost? Can we lose it? Of course, those who do not believe and those who are doubtful will say, hmm, it's a wonderful thing, but it can be lost because there are persons and there are circumstances that will cause us to abandon it and for it also to be taken away from us or forfeit it. So the question right now that runs to our mind is this. Is there such a human being or beings who can take away our salvation? Can that being have such power and influence that they can remove what God has given to us? Oh, is there such a person? That's what the Apostle Paul was asking in verses 33, 34, and 35. And then you would be answering the question. Uh, you would be answering it, and you would say, who would want to do that? Who would want to do that? Well, I tell you, Lots of people, lots of people. People who are offended by our faith. Why you are, are you being criticized, maligned, insulted because of your faith in the, in the Lord Jesus Christ? Because, you know what? The gospel, the Apostle Paul is saying, the gospel is an offense. That's why people are against us. That's why people are against us because the gospel is an offense to what they believe in. It's a totally diametrically opposed to what, we believe, to what the people outside there believed in. So they insult us. You know, I remember times when we have, usually have, you know, my mother's family way back in Pontevedra, we always have our family gathering. And just out of nowhere, for no reason at all, the brothers of my mom would just come out and, you know, say all, nasty things about our faith. Say all nasty things about our faith. You know, that's what the Lord Jesus Christ said. I did not come to, to bring you peace. I have come to bring a sword. Family member against another family member. And that's it. And these are people who are, who are trying to destroy our faith. And then you say, who are the people? Who are other people who wanted to destroy our faith, probably we can say it, our schools, you know. You think our schools is going to confirm, confirm our faith? No way. You know, have you noticed this? You try to bring up your children the best way you can until they grow up. When they go, they, 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 they go to school, 
one year, two years after that, they become rebellious, right? Have you experienced that? You know, uh, I, would bring, I would love to bring my children to school, and then not long after that, when I pick him up, I would go this way, he would go the other way, get inside the car, I wouldn't say anything, I would ask him a question, one answer. And I said, what's happening? They're supposed to be, to be trained well in school, you know what? They are out there to destroy our faith. Their God, then Satan will expose you to friends who have a different opinion about our faith. He exposed me to a friend, to a friend who's uh, very close to me. We studied in the Moscow for four years, and we are in the dorm, and we have breakfast, lunch, and dinner for four years, and we're very close, very religious person. But then after school, after high school, we parted, and we saw each other 30, 40 years after that. And he's a changed man. I was so happy meeting him because I probably would have an opportunity to share to him the gospel. <laughs> But boy, he castigated me. Casting what? What kind of a God? God who sends such kind of storm, category five, you land and destroy and kill all such people? A very difficult question to answer. And he just questioned everything that I shared to him. That's why he told my children, you know what? When you have children of your own, don't send them uh, send them to school, but don't allow them to take up banking and finance because that friend of mine has a course, has banking and finance for a course. And look at him. He was very religious. Now he's an atheist. Oh, my goodness. Boy, I tell you, huh? we are all as believers in the Lord Jesus. We are surrounded by people with such influence and power and impact and sophistication to sway us away from our faith. So let's go back to the question. Is there such a person or persons who would want to take away our salvation? What's the answer of the Apostle Paul for that? The answer of Apostle Paul to that first question is in verse 31b. Simple answer. If God be for us, who can be against us? Think of that for a moment. Is anyone more powerful than God? You know, God has already predetermined our destiny from the beginning when he called us, and the final promised destination is glorification. And there are two people, powerful people, in the Trinity, who is interceding for you and me. Jesus Christ sits the right hand of the Father, interceding in that behalf that we be, remain saved forever. Secondly, the Holy Spirit also intercedes for us in that behalf with groanings that cannot be uttered. Two powerful, all-powerful members of the Trinity interceding in our behalf. How can a true believer be lost? That's the question. Jesus promised in John 10, verse 29, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. What a promise. And we can, you know, to give us some kind of an assurance, we can personalize. Put your name in there. Put your name in there. And say, my Father who has given, who he, he has given, me to Jesus Christ, put your name in there, is greater than all. No one can snatch me, your name, out of my Father's hands. What a promise. Is there a middle ground in there? It's a comprehensive promise. You know, if God says that he causes all things to work for our eternal good, who can undo that? Who can undo that? Who can remove our no condemnation status? So the question here, the first question the, about humans or person or persons who can take away our salvations falls away, disintegrates into this simple statement that the Apostle Paul mentions. If God be for us, who can be against us? God secures us in his plans. Holy Spirit intercedes for us. 
God works all things for our eternal good. And if we are predestined by His foreknowledge to be conformed to the image and likeness of His Son, and He called each and every one of us for a purpose, none of us is going to be lost. None of us is going to be lost. And these things that I mentioned to you relate to a salvation that cannot be lost. That's the first possibility. Second possibility is God himself. God himself. The people around us in this world cannot take away that, that, that salvation. God probably can take away that salvation. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. The Lord takes away. Can he change his mind about us? Can God change his mind about us? Can he be so disappointed with our sins, with so many sins that we commit, and disobedience to the point that he takes back his, the life that he gave us? He regenerated us, gave us new life, caused us to be born again. Does he kill us again? Is keeping us safe give him, gives him too much trouble because of the multitudes of sin that we commit? You know what? Those are legitimate questions that need to be asked about us because these things that I have said are really true about our own lives. We are holy and totally sinful apart from the grace of God. But you know what? The beautiful answer of the Apostle Paul is in verse 32. And I will read this for you. He who did not spare his own son, but gave himself up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Praise to our God. You know, this is a the statement, this particular verse that Apostle Paul mentions here is, this is a classic Jewish argument of the greater to the lesser. In other words, what the Apostle Paul is saying here is that, don't you think that if God gave his son to us for us to be saved, will he not do the lesser thing to keep us? Is keeping us not lesser than giving his own beloved son? That's the principle. That's the principle of giving of, of the lesser to the greater. God gave us the best, the purest, the divinest, the highest, the greatest cost, his own beloved son to save us. Don't you think he would do less in order to keep us? Wow. Romans 5.10. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Ponder upon that statement. Ponder upon those principles I have given to you as I take this sip, okay? So in other words, in other words, if God gave his son to make justification possible, sure to the life of his son would secure our gl glorification permanently and eternally. You know, I was thinking about this, this, this principle of greater to the lesser. You know, frankly, if I had to, this is me now, personally, if I had to sacrifice my life to achieve something valuable and precious that can be lost, oh, I will not do it. I will not do it. Same thing with God. If he has given us this precious salvation for us only to be lost in the end, my goodness, he's not going to give it to us. He's not going to give it to us. It is that simple concept here that the Apostle Paul is bringing. God has done the greater thing. He will, not, he will do the lesser thing in order to keep us. Let me repeat that. Romans 8, verse 38. This is just so beautiful. He who did not spare his own son, but gave himself up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Now, another point that I would like to bring is, if 
No person or persons can separate us from our salvation. It, God himself cannot separate us from his love because he has sacrificed so much for us. There must be another person who can do it. Who do you think is that person? Satan, of course. Oh, he would love to do it. He would love to do it. He would love to do it. And he's doing it to you and me every day of our lives, every moment of our lives. He's doing it to us. Satan tried it with Job. He took all his children away, all his possessions away, possessions that he labored so much and he worked so much. At. And then in just one moment, the Sabaeans came, took all thousands of them, thousands of his words. And then one day, all his children, seven kids, seven boys and three girls, were partying in one building. Then a Yolanda category kind of a storm came in, flattened the building, killed all his son, left him with a wife who's not supposed to say things that she was saying, curse God and die. And then he was filled with boils from head to foot and took a broken piece of battery and was scraping it off from his skin. Boy, I tell you this, that would be a kind of extremity. That would be a kind of extreme sit situation that if you are to lose something, you will lose it right there. Right there. But you know what? In the midst of it all, Job said, even if you slay me, yet I will trust in you. You cannot kill that faith. Why? Because God sustains it in the midst of all situations that you can think about. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He's the tormentor. And day and night, he comes before the presence of God that brings a charge that will result in our condemnation. Can he succeed? Can he succeed? Verse 33, answer that. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. God alone justifies and condemns. He alone does that. And if God declares that we are righteous, who can refute that? There is no higher judge in this world than God. Believers, I say this to you. We are always accused every day of our lives. And that goes on in heaven with the same accusation that Satan has brought before God on the case of Job. There is that. S uh, Satan is always making a case against one, our salvation. And he was saying, oh my goodness, look at these people that you're trying to save. You see, you know how sinful they are, how vile they are, how dirty they are. They, they, every inclination of their heart is only towards sin. And then, and then, and then you gave salvation to these people. S Satan is always making a case to, against us every day of our lives. How can you save these people? That we were, and that's what we, 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 we really are. We are all dirty before the eyes of God. And that's the wonder of all wonders that really boggles my mind is the fact that this is our situations. So wretched, so vile, so dirty, so sinful. And yet, chose to offer his son in our behalf and offer us this salvation that cannot be lost. Then he brings another case against God loving us. How can you love such sinful people? How can you love? But God demonstrates his love in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's how much God loved all of us. He's making a charge against us every day of our lives. He's making a charge against, against God and in God declaring us as righteous and just. God, how can you declare such vile and dirty people righteous and just? 
Can you understand that? I cannot fathom that. But because of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have been called just and righteous, wonder of all wonders. We sin every day of our lives, every day of our lives, but we stand perfect and righteous before God. I praise God for that. Perfect not because of our own making, perfect because of the life of Jesus Christ in it and every one of us. You know, God has already rendered his final verdict based on his sovereign purpose and the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. We have been declared righteous and just, and that settles everything. There is no higher court above God. God is the only court in the universe when it comes to judgment of sin and death. And no amount of accusation from Satan will stand. No effort of Satan's part or destruction will succeed because it is God who justifies. He did it with Peter. He did it with Paul. And he will continually do it to each and every one of us. And that's precisely the reason why sometimes we doubt our salvation. Sometimes we even go to the extreme of even thinking that we can lose our salvation because there is this guy, Satan, who brings that accusation every day of our lives before God, and he is called in the Bible the accuser of the brethren. But friends, do not believe his lie. It has been settled. You have been declared just and righteous before God. That settles it. You cannot lose your salvation forever. On the possibility, the last point here that Apostle Paul would like to say is, on the possibility of losing our salvation through some powerful person and some overwhelming situation, Paul answered it in verse 37 of Romans chapter 8. You know, this particular verse, basa nyo lang ni Permi. Basa, I've read this also many, many times, but I failed to take attention of the word no. The Apostle Paul said, no, in all those things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. In other words, here, the, the, the Apostle Paul was answering an emphatic no to the objections and accusations that we can lose our salvation because there is some person powerful enough to make us lose our salvation and there are evidence happening in our lives so powerful and so overwhelming that we will forfeit it. But here, the Apostle Paul, in verse 37, he is giving an emphatic no when he said no. Nada. Niet. Ochi. Huh. I looked that up in that's German, that's Spanish, and that's Greek. No, no, no. In all those things, you are more than conquerors. And as I end, this is now Paul's glorious declaration. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present or the future, nor any powers, nor height nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Is anything there missed by the statement of the Apostle Paul? Nothing. It's so comprehensive and encompassing. Nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. What then shall we say in response to these things concerning our eternal salvation? Can it be lost? You answer that question. You answer that question. You know, I share this with you because I just want us to enjoy our salvation. So many of us are distraught and sad because thinking that we're losing it. No, you are just losing the joy of your salvation because you sin. I share this so that we can fully enjoy the salvation that God has given us. 
I want us to get out of the fear of losing this precious gift that God has given to us. And I want us to rejoice. I want us to rejoice in the hope that is so secure, given by God as a gift to all of us. It is a God's wonderful, wonderful gift for us all to enjoy. Shall we pray? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for this great assurance. And we are ever thankful for your ministry of your Holy Spirit that clarifies a lot of things to us probably this morning. And I just want to praise you, Father, for this wonderful gift of salvation. And let us, as we together gather as a people of God, we want to collectively say, thank you for saving us. Thank you for saving us. And thank you even more for sustaining that salvation that you give us, that we will never in any way lose it, Father. Thank you even for your word, Father, that's so clear, that confirms to us not only our sonship, not only our being saved, but confirms to us that once we are saved, we are saved for all eternity. Praise be to you, God, our Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.